Hi, everyone, and welcome to Be True, my podcast about the writing I love and the writing I do. I promise I won't rhyme the whole time. I'm John Tessitore, and today, Capuchin, a poem published in issue 21 of Wild Roof Journal. Thank you, my friends. You can find it at wildroofjournal.com and all of my work at johntessitore.com. I record this episode during one of those weeks. We all have them. One of those weeks when, for whatever reason, in my case, family responsibilities, life interrupts any plans you may have had. A run ragged week. A what am I forgetting? Do I have everything? Is everyone else okay? Week. A week in which your sense of responsibility to others and to yourself is greater than your capacity to satisfy anyone's needs, least of all your own. A grab some hash browns and a large coffee as you race by Dunkin' Donuts kind of week. A week in which you just have to accept second best in every way. Because first best is out of reach the moment you wake up. So here I am recording this episode in a bit of a rush. I even feel like I'm stealing the time to do it. But that's actually the appropriate mood for this poem. Among other things, Capuchin is about trying and failing to find order in life trying and failing to stick to the plan. I think of it as a very middle age kind of poem. It's a poem that contrasts daily life with the lives of the Catholic monks of an earlier era in our history, who lived in relative seclusion, whose days were organized by church ritual, who were the keepers of the written word for much of the last millennium, in many cases copying ancient texts by hand for their libraries and, fortunately for us, for posterity. The title, Capuchin refers to the Franciscan order that practiced, and still practices, extreme austerity as it aids the poor. The Capuchins also maintain a very striking little crypt beneath a church in Rome, which is where this poem ends. Behind the trees, a subtle shift to gray, but not yet the dawning, the brightening. Soon I will lift these warm covers and stir, Soon I will begin another changeling day, but I miss my old routines. The monastic order of my life in segments, the specifics all mine, before I was devoured. My bones pecked, picked apart, scoured, sucked clean. In these early hours I am skeletal, an empty frame trying to remember last night's dream. Always the same small cell, the melted candle, my aging hand scrawling someone else's lines. Such a good preparation for the crypt. Perhaps the chapel on the Via Veneto. Across the street, from the hotel, where she and I made love when we were still free to roam, and where I might be buried alone. To be seasoned in the soil of Jerusalem, and after thirty years exhumed, to adorn a rising sun, Ossian, and know exactly how I will be spending the rest of my time. To lay in bed as the sun is rising and think, I don't think I have anything left to give. My bones are pecked, picked apart, scoured, sucked clean. Writers are a dramatic breed, I'll admit, but I think we've all felt this way at one time or another, especially if we tend to be caretakers anyway. It's like my mother always says, Who takes care of the caretaker? I have nothing left to give. (laughs) But that bone image stuck with me for a while. That feeling of laying in bed, fading away down to my own skeleton. It's an image of exhaustion, of limitation, of death in life, or just plain death. And it reminded me of something I saw almost 30 years ago. I was traveling through Rome with my cousins, one of whom had lived in Rome for a while and knew just where to take me. He knew all the places I'd like. This annoyed my cousin, by the way, the fact that he knew what I'd like. Because we'd traveled together before, and I'd been annoying him for years. <laughs> Not his fault. When I travel, I'm even more like a chipmunk than I normally am. All excitement and enthusiasm and twitches. I read the wall signs. I ask questions. I talk and talk and talk. And I forget to eat, and I don't sleep. And it's a lot. So at that point, he knew exactly what would excite me and what would shut me up. One day we were walking up the Via Veneto and he stopped and pointed and said, In here, another church, Our Lady of the Conception of the Capuchins. 
he led us down the stairs into the crypt. Dark, cold, slightly unpleasant, and then six tiny rooms, each a small chapel, and on the walls of each, not the usual paintings, but ornate three-dimensional designs arranged from the bones of dead monks. As Fonzie would say, whoa. <laughs> Almost 4,000 friars were buried in that crypt between 1500 and the 1870s. First in a container of soil from Jerusalem, kept there in the crypt, and then, when the bodies were sufficiently decomposed, dug up, rotated out to become part of the sacred decoration in rooms like the Crypt of Pelvises or the Crypt of the Leg Bones and Thigh Bones. This was truly memento mori, and I was very, very quiet, to my cousin's great relief. But it also seemed fitting, an ossuary of small rooms, the final resting place for monks who lived small, controlled lives. These were all men who knew exactly how they would be spending their time, before and after death. There's good and bad in that, that kind of regimen, that kind of certainty. I recognize the need for both in myself. The tendency, even the desire, to be the caretaker who exists in chaos. I won't say thrive, that's for others to determine. And also the tendency, even the desire, to sit in my cell, my aging hand scrawling someone else's lines. I always fantasize about order and clarity and try to seek as much of it as I can, as this poem suggests. But I'm not sure I could have one without the other. In the end, I'm not sure the monks could either. I suspect it was the muck and disease in which they toiled that made the quiet of the monastery feel like peace. Maybe it was the work that sustained them as much as the discipline and gave the discipline its meaning. One thing I do know, those dead capuchins win the contest for the most beautiful corpse. Their remains are a hell of a lot more striking than mine will be. And so, in the hope that you find just the right balance of order and chaos in your life, this is John Tessitore concluding another installment of Be True. If you've listened this long, thank you. You can find more about my work at johntessitore.com. But first, I need to go back to Mark Twain's travel book, Innocence Abroad, chapter 28, in which he describes the Franciscan ossuary in more detail. It's easy enough to find these days. Let's read it together. Special thanks to me for today's theme music, which I call A Chord. Maybe we'll talk again. And if you enjoy this little podcast, leave some stars or a review and tell your friends. In the meantime, I gotta feed the dog. All right, Luna, I'm coming.